Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant songs with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the sound of singing. With trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord. Christmas for Ben. We are going to conduct a serious sociological experiment this morning. And so I need the best of you. But to help uh, with this experiment, I'm going to ask an expert to join me on stage. So would you welcome to the stage our new tech director, Mr. Tori Sanders. Now, Tori just started here a couple weeks ago, but Tori is, is our technical expert. And you brought, you brought a piece of high-tech equipment with you today, didn't you? He brought, he brought a, uh, a decibel meter yeah. so we can test uh, the audio levels in this room. And what we're going to do, and, and this is calibrated, right? You got it set up? We're good? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to respond by shouting and cheering for a couple of different things. First of all, I'm going to ask you to cheer for which is your favorite, McDonald's or Whataburger? And then I'm going to ask you to cheer for which is your favorite, Haagen-Dazs vanilla chocolate chip or Bluebell vanilla chocolate chip. And then I'm going to ask you to cheer for which is your favorite, the Houston Texans or the Dallas Cowboys. And we will measure the response on the decibel meter to see what this is. This is a very highly scientific experiment. So we'll go through them one at a time. I'll count down three, two, one. And on one, you cheer, you shout for your favorite. The first is McDonald's and Whataburger. So if McDonald's is your favorite, cheer for this in three, two, one. Eighty-seven. All right. If Whataburger is your favorite, cheer in three, two. One hundred and one. One hundred and one. Whataburger. All right. Hagen Dazs and Bluebell. If your favorite is Hagen Dazs vanilla cookies and cream, cheer in three, two. One hundred and ninety. Ninety. If your favorite is Bluebell Vanilla Cookies and Cream, cheer in three, two. 108. 108. All right. Find out who's friends of Dave's. Houston Texans or Dallas Cowboys? If you are a fan of the Houston Texans, cheer in three, two, one. 98. God's favorite, Dallas Cowboys in three, two, one. 125. 125. All right, now we want to do, this is, this is the critical test. This is sort of the, the way for us to establish the standard and the baseline. I'm going to ask you to cheer at the same time for one or the other of these two items. At the same time, you will either cheer hook them for the Texas Longhorns, or gig them for the Texas Aggies. So if you're cheering for the Aggies, you cheer, uh, gig them, or whatever whooping you want to do. And if you are a Longhorn fan, you say hook them, or whatever cheering you want to do. Just make sure that they're different. So we're going to cheer together to see what the total decibels are. Aggies and Longhorns in three, two, one fifteen. One fifteen. 
but I could not tell which was which. So, so let's try it. Let's try it separately. For the Aggies, three, two. 98. For the Longhorns, three, two. 101. 101. Welcome. Can you say thank you to Tori Sanders? Sure. Now, the reason we conducted that test today is because we are talking about sanctified shouting. We're talking about, in our study of joy, at this Christmas season, looking through Psalm 98, we come to verses 4, 5, and 6, where the psalmist challenges us to shout for joy to the Lord. And to shout for joy to the Lord and all of the earth. And to burst forth or to burst into jubilant song with, with music. And to make music to the Lord with the harp, the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn, shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Now what we are challenged to do here in these three verses in Psalm 98 is, I believe, to shout in three different kinds of ways. The first two, I think we understand how, how to shout this way. The first is what I call the shout out loud shout, the verbal, the yelling, the screaming shout. The second is not as familiar, it's what I call the, syn the synergistic or synoptic or the singing shout. And the third kind is perhaps something you never considered, but it's what I call the silent shout or how to shout with your mouth shut. Today we're going to talk about how do we shout for joy to the Lord in this season. But before we talk about that, would you pray with me for a moment? Father in heaven, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight and that you would use your word spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to challenge us to be people who are joyful and contagious in our joy. May we be a truly dangerously joyful people. Pray that for myself, for my family, and for all of us here. For I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Why do we shout? Why do we shout? Why do we scream? Why do we yell? Well, I think, I think it's different. It depends. Some of it depends on how you were raised. I was raised, and I was told many times that, it, that I needed to calm down, that I should not shout or yell. I particularly should not yell at my brother or my sister. It was definitely outlawed. I was not allowed to yell at my parents. And, uh, and to raise our voice meant that, that this something bad was going on. So calm was kind of the demeanor of our house. Now, I had friends who were very different. There was a friend who lived down the road from me. His name was Kenny Monty. And Kenny Monty's family was first-generation American Italians. And these people lived at volume 11, especially Kenny's older sister, Bernadette. This was the 1960s, and she was a woman named Bernadette, and she had helmet hair. You know what that was? I mean, it just kind of looked like a hat on her head. And she lived at, Kenny! Kenny! Tell you and your stupid friend to get out of here! I'm sick of you. Don't go to my room. That was Bernadette all the time. But why do we yell? Sociologists and psychologists have analyzed it, and the American Psychological Association published this statement when it comes to why we shout. Humans shout not only when they are fearful and aggressive, but also when they experience other affective states. And these diverse states that elicit screams and shouts are similar to a variety of inner emotional states that are more commonly expressed in less intense nonverbal vocal emotions, such as fear, anger, sadness, pleasure, and joy. Sociologists and psychologists break shouting and screaming and yelling down into two categories. 
The one category is the category of negative vocalization, or what they call an alarm verbal affect. And what an alarm verbal affect, or a negative vocalization is, it's those screams, those yells, those shouts that we make when we are terrified, or we are surprised, or we are shocked when we are caught off guard, the, those verbalizations, they call alarm effect ver verbalizations or affects. There's also, and, and this, is a, this is a category, I think we're familiar with it. If, if, if someone surprises you and, and you say, oh, oh no, and that's, uh, that's an alarm or a negative verbal affect. There was, a, there was a test, I don't know if any of you read about this, and I think it's, I think it's an urban legend. I don't think it's true. But there was a, a group from the National Highway Transportation Safety Board back in the 1990s who wanted to study what was going on with drivers before they had an impact with their car that totaled their automobile. So they created digital recording devices that they placed in the cars that they only retrieved if the car was totaled in an accident. And then they compiled the, the, the record, what was being said in the cars just before impact. Not surprisingly, what they found out was in the moments before an impact that totaled the car, most people shouted out an expletive. Now this was true everywhere except in the South. In the South, they had euphemisms for the expletives like gosh darn, aw shucks, or bless your heart except in the state of Texas. In the state of Texas, they found that commonly before an accident where a pickup truck usually was totaled, this was said, hey Bubba, hold my beer and watch this. <laughs> now I don't know if that's true, it's probably not true, but the reality is sociologists tell us that we scream or we yell or we shout because of a negative experience. But there's also a positive vocalization. There's a category of shouts and screams and yells that have a non-alarm positive affect or a verbal affect. These are shouts of joy. These are cheers. These are shouts of approval or celebration. These are the kinds of things that the psalmist is encouraging us to express when the psalmist says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. It is, an express, it is a challenge, particularly in this season, to be people who shout with joy. The word that occurs there in verse 4 and in verse 6 is the Hebrew word ra'ach. And ra'ach can mean a call to victory. It can mean uh, a, a shout of celebration or a shout of 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 congregation, of bringing people together. You shouted to call people to rally together, whether it was in warfare or in celebration. It is often used as a verbalization of praise or a verbalization of worship. But there in these, four, in these three verses, in verses 4, 5, and 6 of Psalm 98, I want to suggest that the, the psalmist is challenging us to shout in three different ways. And the first one is the most obvious. It is, it is what I call the shout out shout or the shout out loud shout. It's in verse six where it says, we are to shout with joy to the Lord with trumpets and with the blast of the ram's horn. It's been archeologically proven that trumpets, some kind of metal horn existed as far back as 6,000 years ago and trumpets and horns made, of, made of, of metal, usually silver or bronze, trumpets have appeared in India and in China and Southeast Asia, in, uh, throughout Africa and throughout the Middle East, sometimes fashioned out of wood, most of the time metal horns, because they were the loudest instruments that could be made. The Hebrews had a unique instrument that was the ram's horn. They called it the shofar. 
And the shofar had a very distinct tone. And the shofar was typically used to call people, the people of God, into worship or calling the people to congregate together. And the blowing of the shofar was a, was a call to come together. It was a call to be with each other. It's interesting that there have been studies about how, how human beings react to shouting how people react, how our brains react neurologically to, to shouts or screams or yells. And there was a study that was released in 2021 by a, by a uh, Swiss psychologist named Dr. Sasha Fromholtz. And it was published in the uh, Public Library of Science in 2021. And it was a study that they did at the University of Zurich it took a couple of years, but what they did was they invited a large group of people in one at a time to record screams and shouts. They would show them images. Some of the images were images of children and images of celebration, images of, of enjoyable moments, and some of them were terrifying images. And they recorded hundreds of these screams and shouts, and they categorized them into negative and positive screams and shouts. And then they took another group of people, and in a room where they were set up to monitor their brain activity, they looked at each of these, or they listened to each of these screams, and what they found was not what they expected. They found that people reacted more dramatically and more easily to the positive screams and the positive shouts than the negative ones. This is what they said in the, in the article, in the PLS article. It said, the study revealed that people perceive and process positive shouts more efficiently than alarming ones. The participants were much more able to classify or to distinguish these positive shouts much more than the negative shouts. When someone shouts, they are letting another person know how they're feeling. That communication component shows how shouts can be a blunt way of sharing information. Researchers concluded that positive shouts are a way of socializing. So when the psalmist challenges us to shout for joy to the Lord, he's challenging us to shout out loud. And the first challenge I'd like to give us during this Christmas season is that we should be people who are shouting our joy out loud. We should be sharing our gratitude and our thanks, our appreciation, sharing out loud, verbalizing to people who matter to us, people who have made a difference in our lives, taking the opportunity to give thanks, taking the opportunity to live out loud, to live our joy in front of others. And what the science tells us is that, that, that that's what we're longing for. It's what we are searching for. Our brains are hardwired to receive that kind of affirmation, that kind of appreciation. So perhaps we can be a people who shout out loud, who live the out loud celebrations and appreciations and gratitude who aren't afraid to say, thank you, and I appreciate you. This is, this is what it means to shout for joy to the Lord, to shout out loud. It, it also means to do a, a sort of synergistic or a, or, or a singing kind of shout, a symbiotic shout. What it says there in verse 5 of Psalm 98 is we are to shout out for joy to the Lord with the harp and the sound of singing. Now we don't know what the singing was like in the book of Psalms. All the Psalms were songs and they were definitely sung. We know that the Hebrew people sang the Psalms. Well, we don't know the music. We know they sang them all the time. In fact, in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13, it talks about the dedication of Solomon's temple, the biggest event in the history of the people of God for 400 years. And this dedication of Solomon's temple says it was accompanied by music. 
There were, there were cymbals and there were drums and there were trumpets and there were horns and there were every other kind of instrument and there was loud singing. The people sang and what they sang were the psalms. And we know that from that phrase there in 2 Chronicles 5.13. It says that they sang, he is good and his love endures forever. That, that exact same line is found 50 times in the psalms. It's found five times in Psalm 118. It's found 26 times in the 136th Psalm. Now, while we don't know what the sound, what the notes were, what it was that they were singing exactly, we know that the singing was, was how they harmonized. I think you understand the power of music. And music, music takes things that are dissonant and things that are, that are out of harmony and brings resolution and can bring harmony. It's, it's what music does. Music is the language of our souls. I remember a number of years ago, there was a musician who played here often at Riverbend. His name was Tony Campisi. And Tony was a world-class flautist and saxophone player. And, and Tony, Tony uh, had a fall and he had a brain injury and his health began to deteriorate. And I remember Carlton Dillard and I went to see Tony at a rehab hospital in the last days of his life. And Tony didn't recognize Carlton or I and he really couldn't communicate. But one of his students, a flute student, had come in with a flute and he handed Tony a flute. And while Tony couldn't interact with any human being, they put the flute in his hand and he played as if he were fine. It's the power of music. There's a, there, there's a study, a number of studies, by a man named Dr. Oliver Sacks. Dr. Oliver Sacks was a British trained physician who was a psychiatrist and a neurologist and Dr. Sachs moved to America after he graduated from medical school and devoted his life to working with the chronically mentally ill in the public hospital system in New York City. It would be hard to imagine anything more desperate than caring for chronically ill people who had been abandoned by their families and abandoned by their society and warehoused in mental hospitals and sanatoriums in the greater New York area, but he devoted his life to it. He wrote a number of books. One of his books that was published in 1990 was turned into a movie called Awakenings, starring Robert, Robert, Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. And it was the story of Dr. Oliver Sacks' experimentation with psychotropic drugs called La Dopa that, that helped a, a patient who had been virtually incognitive for, whole life, for his whole life to revive. That was the character played by Robert De Niro. But it was in 2007 that Dr. Oliver Sacks published a book called Musicophilia. And it's a collection of stories, dozens and dozens of stories of people's lives who at the most desperate time in their, in their struggle mentally and psychologically were therapeutically helped through music. He tells the story of a man named Clive Wagner who was a musicologist, a PhD. He was a concert organist and a choral conductor who had a, a damaging encephalitis in his brain and lost not only his retrograde memory, but he actually lost all of his short-term memory. His wife tells a story about how when she was talking to him after he was first recovering from his illness, that he would talk to her until he blinked. And when he blinked, he would open his eyes and not remember who he was talking to. His memory was completely erased until music was put in front of him. And then he could play and perform and understand the music as he had before his brain trauma. Dr. Stacks in his book, Musicophilia, talks about the power of music. This is what he says. Music can move us to the heights or depth of emotion. It can persuade us to buy something or remind us of our first date. It can lift us out of depression when nothing else can. It can get us dancing to its beat. Music can lift us out of depression or move us to tears. It is a remedy, a tonic, orange juice for the ear. But the power of music goes much, much further. It can provide access, even when no medication can, to movement, to speech, to life. 
Indeed, music occupies more areas of our brain than language does. Music is part of being human, and there is no human culture in which, not, in which it is not highly developed and esteemed. Humans are a musical species. Music is not a luxury, but a necessity. Music has bonding power. It's primal social cement. The next challenge that I think the psalmist is giving us is to live in harmony, to make music, to take the dissonance of the world that we live in and resolve it. It is, it is a call to make music with our lives, but you're saying, uh, I can't sing. It has less to do with singing than living harmoniously. It is a call, it is a call to, to resolve the dissonance of the world, and I know how hard that is. I realize many of us are saying, Dave, you look around the world, there's, we got no shot. We can't get along with our neighbors. We can't get along with people on other sides of the earth. We can't get along with people on the other side of the street. And, 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 and really, Dave, I, I can't really do that because you don't know how hard my life is. But the psalmist is challenging us to choose to sing. The psalmist is challenging us to choose joy. You realize joy is a choice. Happiness is a reaction. Joy is a decision. And when we, when we harmonize with others, when, when we find resolution, when our soul sings, we are, we are choosing joy. The psalmist challenges us, challenges us to sing out loud, challenges us to sing out to the Lord with the trumpets and the blare of the shofar, the ram's horn. And the psalmist challenges us to, to sing synergistically, to shout, to shout symbiotically, to shout and create harmony. But there's a third thing, and, it, and it's, this is the unusual one. The psalmist challenges us to the silent shout. In verse 5, it says, shout out to the Lord, all the earth, and, and, and to do this with the harp. Just with the harp. There's evidence that harps have existed for three or 4,000 years. And, and even today, if you see a, a concert harp with a large soundboard, the loudest that a harp can play is about 80 decibels. It's estimated that the ancient harps, which were animal guts strung between, between a fork or, or strung between two pieces of wood, the, the, most, the loudest it could be was 30 or 40 decibels, just above a whisper. And so, so the idea that we are to shout for joy to the Lord with the harp means, means to do it quietly, to do it almost silently. To have, to have moments in the chaos and in the mess of reflection and consideration and meditation. That we shout out to the Lord with our mouth shut. I don't know if you're familiar with what I do for a living, but this is what I do for a living. And what I do for a living, accordingly, in this season, this is chaos. What is going on at Christmas time in the church, and it's been true of my entire professional career, there are more things to do than I have time to do them. More parties to attend, more invitations, and more thank you notes to write than I can possibly ever write there. This, this is the most chaotic time of my professional life, and I love this. And I especially love the chaos that I introduce into my family. Christmas has always been a time when we have kind of gone over the top and, and, and done things celebratory and really tried to make it, tried to make it a, a high energy experience. But you know what I've learned to do over the last 20 years or so is I've, I've learned to take a moment in the midst of the chaos to take a breath. Sometimes it's at the dinner table, at Christmas dinner, and, and my family and our friends and what other strays we brought in are sitting around our table, and, and everybody's talking and is laughing, and, and there's good food and good wine, and, and it's a great time, and I'll just sit. 
and I'll just soak it in. Sometimes I'll sit on the sofa and I'll just, I'll just watch the most precious people on earth to me gather around and exchange gifts and, and joke and, and tell stories. But I, but I make it, I, I'm intentional about taking a moment to take, to take a breath. When it says that we shout for joy to the Lord with the harp, the harp is the cry of our heart. It is the shout of our soul. It is, it is that longing to be connected. It is that longing to be fulfilled. It is the silent shout that calls us, that calls us to appreciate, that calls us to give thanks, that calls us to reflect, not just on, on what we don't have or what we didn't do, or who isn't there. And all of those things are worth considering and mulling over. But the invitation to shout for the Lord is, is that invitation to be thankful, to be appreciative, to be meditative and contemplative and reflective. It's an invitation for us to, to gather together. I think, I think this is part of the ra'ach where it says that we are to shout, I think it invites us to, to have a perspective that I'm going to take stock. I'm going to take measure. And I may recognize the things that I don't have and the things that I've lost and the things that I have not accomplished, but I will not ignore the blessings that I have been given and the benefits that I have experienced and the generosity that I have shown and have been shown. You see, I don't think, I don't think the ra'ah is a call to perform. I think the ra'ah is, is a call, it, it's a call to reflect. We shout out for joy to the Lord, all the earth. We shout out to the Lord with, with a sense of authenticity with a sense of honesty, with a sense of danger. This is what the psalmist is calling us to do. When the psalmist says, shout to the Lord for joy, all the earth burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with the trumpet and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout out before the Lord, the King. I want to do one final test, one final social experiment today. And it's not to find out how loud we can be, but how quiet our shout can be, that we can be deafened by silence. So today I just want to take a minute to be silent. Will you join with me?